just to introduce uh, Dave. So Dave was a, an undergrad at University of well, UMIST. The full acronym UMIST. You are going to have to remind me, Dave, because it's uh, a defunct organisation. Yeah, it, it is. It is. Uh, God rest its soul. It, University of Manchester Institute of Science and Technology. Okay. And so he did his PhD then at the University of Manchester, moving on from UMIST. From there, he took on a, a postdoc role. Most of much of Dave's work has been in the area of environmental aerosols. So he's had funding from the National Centre for Atmospheric Science (NCAS). He is currently a reader at the University of Manchester. He's a Turing Fellow, um, and really his work I would characterise as really spanning from understanding aerosol microphysics, which is where he started and is where we have a lot of collaborations, through mm -hmm. to actually now looking at large scale air quality uh, networks um, and doing some experiments as well as some modeling. Um, Dave is actually the, the Manchester co-investigator for the CDT and you will have an opportunity to learn from Dave later in the CDT training. He's gonna come and do some, some uh, programming training. Okay, so um, Dave, we'll pass over to you uh, now um, and uh, there'll be some time for questions at the end. Actually, could someone just hit the light switch over there? I'm going to suggest we just dim the light. Is it the screen easier to see? Just give it a quick, tap. quick, quick tap. There we go. Thanks. <coughs> okay. Right. Okay. Well, hi everyone. Um, thanks for the intro, Jonathan. It's uh, it's a pleasure to deliver the first webinar of the CDT. And as Jonathan said, I'll see some of you very soon in January uh, to look at some aerosol modeling. Um, this is a talk I gave at the European Aerosol Conference recently in Gothenburg. Um, so if anyone, I guess no one is online, but if they were, I would say, you know, if they've seen it before, I apologize, but you know, any burning questions that come from that, do ask me. So as Jonathan said, um, my background is, is uh, developing mechanistic models of aerosol physics and chemistry, if you like. And trying to understand the impacts they have uh, largely on the environment but also straddling areas such as health now um, and my venture into machine learning so I'm coming at this from in a very applied sense and I hope that really helps set the scene really because my venture into machine learning really is coming at it from the angle of complexity because we know that the aerosol particles in you know from a, from a single particle perspective through to ensembles can be very complex systems to try and understand. And traditional numerical methodologies don't necessarily deliver what we want to still at the moment. So I'm, I'm trying to explore whether machine learning is an alternative uh, research tool uh, to tackle those complexity challenges. And with that in mind, um, rather than talking about the ins and outs of um, specifics of neural networks, network architectures, training strategies and other things. I'm keeping this talk at a really kind of high level community perspective because I think we're at the stage now where that a set of community questions on this, how we take machine learning forward, if at all, is a really important place to be at at the moment. So my talk is structured accordingly. Um, I'll spend if you know, I can, some time talking about what is machine learning uh, and then why use it. And that includes examples from broader scientific disciplines. What, how are people using it? But then focusing on what's going on in the aerosol community. It's a brief focus, really, uh, because there is quite a lot of literature emerging, which you'll see shortly. And once we have a feel for this flow, I want to talk about data. And I... I the fact that I've said it three times means that I think this is an important issue for us to focus on. Uh, that then follows through into these community needs that I talked about and where we want to take it. And what we'll have really is a cyclical process where depending on how aerosol science progresses over the next few years, that will dictate what we do with machine learning and why. And therefore that influences you know, how we build up capability in this area. And throughout the talk, there are various quotes, pictures, and questions for you as well. So you can think about asking some questions at the end, if you indeed want to. So um, what is machine learning? You'd think that would be an easy answer. Uh, and actually, it's, it's such a big area, and it's growing um, every day at the moment. It draws out um, 
equal amounts of frustration and joy in people because there is so much hype at the moment. Um, it, it can switch people off, but at the, at the, the core, the core really is, is taking an algorithmic approach to understand something about data and then doing something with that understanding. Okay. And I like this summary really that's come from um, uh, MathWorks, I think, you know, which is says machine learning is the practice of using algorithms to parse data, learn from it, and then make a determination a prediction about something in the world. That sounds relatively straightforward. Um, a bit tongue in cheek, whatever it is, it's blue. So I've been to so many meetings now where people show these wonderful images of uh, neural networks and other things that always tends to have a, a blue hue associated with it. I just thought it was quite, quite amusing really. But joking aside, of course, there is a rich history behind machine learning and it stretches all the way back through to fundamental developments in um, compute, computational um, hardware and numerical developments. And this um, concentric um, area approach is actually quite useful because I think a lot of people mismatch machine learning with artificial intelligence. Um, and it's useful to understand that artificial machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence. You can think of it more as a way of the, the engine room, if you like, behind artificial intelligence systems. And I guess some of you will have heard a lot about deep learning in the news over the last year or so. And deep learning is a subset, again, of machine learning. But it does stretch back all the way back to the 50s. And um, it's really only in recent times that significant developments in software, computational software and hardware is bringing a lot of machine learning capabilities to a lot of uh, researchers and you know, members of other bodies. Um, what I haven't added, and I'll touch on in this talk, is uh, uh, above this area is data science. And data science brings with it everything from ethics of data gathering through to provenance, security, and, and other things. So it's a huge area of research but machine learning is definitely one of the buzzwords we hear about at the moment. And before we go on to what it is, I, I always think from a technological perspective, it's always useful to look at where something is on what's called the Gartner hype cycle. And I don't, I'm not sure if any of you have seen this before, but what this plot demonstrates is um, the level of expectation of a particular technology as a function of time from the point of innovation trigger. Now, this isn't necessarily a linear scale um, on, on either axes, but the point being here, for the last three years or so, machine learning was always at the peak of expectation. Now it's not even on the list. And in fact, you'll see here, you see deep neural networks or deep learning. Okay. Um, and that's largely going back to the point I mentioned a few a minute or so ago, which is that accessibility of machine learning now. More communities are adopting it in their particular domains. And what that means is the expectations are going to drop when people actually uh, appropriately quantify its usability for their particular purpose. And that means that a lot of the hype will drop but it does mean there is some time still for mass adoption of the technology. So you'll see here, for example, augmented, augmented reality is at the pit of the trough of disillusionment. I remember a few years ago when um, augmented reality was a lot in the news, I guess some of you do as well. And it was again, a very exciting technology, but people are now realizing just how useful it is. There's still some machine learning elements on this side of the graph. So for example, here, edge AI, so that's artificial intelligence. I guess the appropriate vernacular for you guys would be in the field. So at the point of measurement, and that's a series of challenges. So to take the information at the point of measurement and turn that into something useful is a little bit far, is a little bit um, behind deep neural networks, for example, at the moment. The Tensions that pull a technology along this graph can be quite varying. From a deep, from a machine learning perspective, it isn't just academic. So we're seeing a lot of uptake at the moment, and this quite, this is straddles aerosol science as well, potentially. You know, how quickly we go from the peak of expectation through to wide scale adoption, which is called the plateau of productivity, can be driven a lot by industry uh, and or academia. Okay, 
So this talk, we're going to we're going to take a journey through the trough of delusionment. Uh, but I hope at the end of the talk, we'll end on some really positive points to take away from the aerosol community perspective. What I did, I thought it'd be interesting to actually see within the aerosol literature, peer-reviewed literature, um, what the change in uptake of certain machine learning practices are. So what I did was this basic scopus analysis where I pulled out um, all papers uh, from the early, early 90s that mentioned aerosol science and also referred to a particular branch of machine learning. Uh, why this is interesting is because, so for example, some of these methods mentioned here fall within different areas of machine learning. I have a separate machine learning uh, line here. So we've, we've wanted to extract patterns from data for a long time. This is not a new need. But as I said before, it's the accessibility of this technology that's now driving a lot of the increased uptake. But also there's a devil in the detail here because behind this graph are tremendous developments in aerosol instrumentation and aerosol traditional models that are also driving this uptake. So if you take PMF, positive matrix factorization, this is largely behind the aerosol mass spectrometer, which is a huge community now in trying to understand source and source and process contribution to mass spectrum <coughs> fingerprints. But what's interesting here is you see this slow rise uh, in the reference to machine learning. So it's entering our vernacular, but certainly, as I said before, we've been using techniques that follow the machine learning heading for a while. So obviously this is this year, so we expect this line to drop up. I would say, by the way, when I did the search, one paper came out as being from 2020. So. If we've got AI writing our future papers, I think we truly, we truly do live in wonderful times. Um, when you break those papers down by aerosol discipline, you see a dominance in environmental science, uh, and these tend to be applied machine learning. Um, so no developments of fundamental numerical libraries, but nonetheless using the, the, the wealth of libraries available to us already. But you see quite a broad range of topics being covered across aerosol sciences. So for example, um, if you look at, there are some papers in physics and astronomy, and actually what's going on there is you get different challenges. Sometimes you have researchers looking at vast amounts of data here, and therefore they're having to develop their own numerical libraries to deal with that. Um, this doesn't mean that one particular domain, as I said before, one particular domain will drive the developments of machine learning across aerosol sciences, because we know, of course, and if you guys are learning quite rapidly, there's a huge industrial interest in um, aerosol science. And it's likely that the uptake of machine learning in those industrial areas will actually pull this, change the shape of this graph, probably. But we do know, of course, that a huge area of interest at the moment is in air quality and climate science. So that's where a lot of these papers sit. So what is machine learning? So you've heard a lot about broad, um, broad, the broad need to extract something from data, but you can actually break that down from a top level perspective. And I think this diagram does that quite nicely. So normally talk, people talk, when they talk about machine learning, they talk about either unsupervised learning, supervised learning, there's now semi-supervised learning that connects the two, and more recently, reinforcement learning. Unsupervised learning, in some ways, is kind of like the holy grail. And what that means is you, you, you get the algorithm to extract something from the data without giving it any prior training. And training, when I say training, I mean in the sense of, here are some known answers. Please recognize these or other things in the data set. And common techniques from unsupervised learning include, for example, cluster analysis. Uh, and you might have come across clust various clustering algorithms before, such as k-means or agglomerative clustering. And that's used across many different, many different domains. And some of them are listed here from targeted marketing. So if you have a supermarket card, people will be looking at your clustering your data to see what group you fit into and giving you adverts accordingly, uh, and customer segmentation. And also we have dimensionality reduction. Um, in many areas of science, we have these wonderful instruments that measure hundreds of variables. Understanding the latent structures in those variables is very important because that also, that also gives us an idea of what we can actually ignore in building the next generation of instruments. 
principal component analysis fits within those techniques. Uh, and that's quite a simple method because it assumes linear contributions from those components. And more recently, there's some exciting developments in methods such as they're called variational autoencoders. And that's mapping latent structures to a probability space, which is quite powerful. Supervised learning algorithms probably get the most attention. And that includes classification. So you'll probably, if you've heard anything in the media, it's probably been on image recognition. Supervised learning algorithms require a subset of the answers to be known. So I should say, by the way, going back to the unsupervised uh, learning, the answers derived from those don't necessarily have a correct answer. So it requires domain scientists to understand what that means. In supervised learning, there is some data that's already been derived to actually affect, to deliver that information. So you train your algorithm on some known answers and then apply it to, let's say, a much bigger data set from another environment, let's say, and it would see if it can recognize some of those images, for example. Uh, and a lot, and as I said before, a lot of the attention is on classification. But we also have regression. And that means using machine learning to predict, for example, a continuous variable. Uh, and there are some here. So for example, market forecasting is a big area of research. Can you predict the state of the market in a few years time? And what's good about that is you might not necessarily already have an algorithmic basis to make that model. So machine learning offers the potential to do that. And we'll talk about interpre interpretability uh, later on. Reinforcement learning is a relatively new area of machine learning. Um, and in terms of media coverage, and I say media coverage a lot because it is a, a lot of the um, um, information people have uh, actually comes from the news. This is a quite a new area of machine learning. You probably have come across that when you've heard news such as the Google AlphaGo experiment, right? Where you have an algorithm that now beats the best Go player in the world. And that's where you have a virtual agent learning from its environment and adopting accordingly. And one of the biggest uses I've came across recently from a talk from Google is optimizing energy delivery in data centers because data centers are now take up 15% of the global electricity uh, supply. So, you know, that's, that's a big area of research we've taken on at the moment. From an aerosol perspective, there's some really nice, um, what I've tried to do is get a feel for from, again, from the peer reviewed literature, particular areas that fall into either. From an unsupervised perspective, typically the use of clustering falls into trying to unravel the contribution from a, a source or process to a mass spectral fingerprint. So that typically focuses on, again, environmental aerosols, where you try and infer the physical and chemical state from a mass spectral fingerprint. Dimensionality reduction can actually improve the clustering, but also it can give us an idea of what, what are the important features in these, or the important uh, latent features in these data sets. And some people are using that to um, develop miniaturized version of, versions of aerosol instrumentation. So as I said before, if you have a new instrument that has, um, it measures hundreds of different variables, dimensionality reduction techniques can actually rank order those variables. And that might give you an idea of what you can design more efficiently in your next generation of instruments, depending on, on what the instrument's designed to do. There's some really nice supervised learning examples as well. And, and I would say that these have come, they've come out over the last few years. And typical examples include going back to source and process contribution. Imagine that people study aerosols in the lab and they have these fingerprints and they can be mass spectral, but also optical as well. You train the algorithm to detect and you have a label of those. So you train the algorithm and say, look, this spectral fingerprint is from a biogenic precursor or from anthropogenic precursor, please recognize that this in my ambient data set. And that's what supervised learning algorithms are being used for at the moment. There's some interesting challenges that straddle both, uh, in particular from the supervised learning perspective, is trusting that those labels can actually be used in the field. So that goes, again, it boils down to domain expertise that what does my data mean? And we'll, we'll get to that shortly. Regression is an area that I'm particularly interested in because modeling aerosol particles can be a, a huge challenge. We're constantly identifying new processes uh, and sources that 
affect how aerosols evolve chemically and physically. And new, traditional numerical models struggle. And it's largely because we adapt those uh, models to, in the, uh, to current comp computational hardware platforms. But machine learning algorithms offer the potential to bypass that um, challenge and actually build a surrogate model of a particular process that runs much quicker. So imagine that you want to include a new process in a <coughs> global climate model. A lot of global climate modelers tell you you can't. We, we're, all, we, we're using enough resource already. So that's what a lot of people are doing on machine learning from an aerosol perspective. But not just from a large scale perspective as well. If you look at single particles, for example, predicting mixing state can be quite a challenge. So we see a lot of work there. And there are different stresses uh, onto the type of algorithm you use. If you want an algorithm to run very quickly or you don't mind the algorithm to take a very long time, that can give you different levels of information. I haven't come across any examples of reinforcement learning, but that doesn't mean to say that they couldn't be used in aerosol science. And I've mentioned a few potential areas I think that could be useful here. Minimization, for example, predicting the phase state of a particle that has hundreds or thousands of compounds, that would be an interesting application of reinforcement learning. Or even optimizing the structure of our models. Uh, so in some, somehow in real time, knowing that you can throw away a certain process could be an area of use. Okay. What is striking, Jonathan will recognize this figure, is that what's really nice from a lot of the machine learning papers from the last year or so is it's, it's facilitating collaboration across aerosol disciplines. Um, so I've got just two examples here. And that might be, an, again, a situation where an algorithmic platform does not exist for you to actually bridge those gaps but machine learning can take the data and do that for you. And that might include studies such as um, modeling aerosols from their point of um, emission through to the quantifying the impact of a particular medical um, delivery uh, system. Over the last eight months or so, or even six months, there's a hell of a lot of papers coming out uh, to try and understand the effects of air pollution control regulation. So what you've got there is you're actually crossing uh, fundamental aerosol science disciplines with social sciences as well. So it does offer a lot of potential for taking aerosol science across in, as a multidisciplinary, in a multidisciplinary sense into new areas of research uh, territory. But uh, we could spend a long time talking about the uh, you know the the, the very the, the hugely potential the ben potential benefits of machine learning in an algorithmic sense, but we tend to forget about data. Now, a few years ago, um, big data was straddling most areas of discussion across science, and we've kind of lost sight of the usefulness of data in some ways. And this is really a, an actually cultural challenge, and it covers everything from how we trust the data what metadata is associated with our measurements, who took the measurements, what instrument configuration was used, um, what composition space does it represent? And it is a cultural challenge because a recent survey has found out that actually data preparation takes over 90% of the workload when you're applying machine learning. And this goes back to what I was saying before about the accessibility of machine learning libraries now. In a very small amount of code, you can import fantastic machine learning algorithm. You can fit and train to your data within a couple of minutes or even seconds, but that doesn't necessarily mean you've built something good. And the problem here is from a data scientist perspective, it's viewed as a boring part of the work, but it's absolutely really essential, understanding what your data means before you apply machine learning. And this is actually a figure from a Forbes article that more or less you know, highlighted the proportions of work that needs to go in before you apply machine learning. You see here cleaning and organizing data, removing outliers, getting rid of erroneous points, uh, mining for patterns. And, you know, and that's not to say that refining algorithms is important. I mean, once you start working with neural networks, for example, that could have a huge impact on your performance, but it's still, it requires domain scientists to be involved in the pipeline. And that's what I say at the bottom here, domain expertise and calibration standards are essential but it's not an exciting discussion to have and that needs to change. Um, 
And when people start thinking about where machine learning might be useful for them, quite often the first question is how much data do I need? And this is another really important question to have because in some areas in, in aerosol science, if you, for example, applying um, supervised methods, getting that training data set can either be very expensive or very long. So it means that you don't have the huge wealth of data to apply the algorithms you see from the likes of Google or IBM. And I think this, this algorithm really sums it up quite nicely. So what you've got here is a qualitative performance as a function of the amount and da of data. And here, you know, you see tremendous benefits and improvements in systems when you, you have the likes of Google applying their uh, reinforcement learning algorithms, deep learning networks, but they've got huge amounts of data. And actually, the, 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 as you get few, smaller and smaller amounts of data, these new powerful techniques don't work very well. They actually start to overfit quite easily. And the older algorithms that might not be necessarily as trendy perform better. So you need to understand that, you know, what's the data-driven challenges here? Where can you get the data from? How much do you have? So with this in mind, when you look at um, applied sciences, such as ours, you then fall into an area called feature engineering. And this, again, is that precursor step to applying the machine learning. What data do I have and is it useful? And we had a recent paper a few years ago where we were trying to predict um, aerosol mass spectra uh, as a function of uh, the molecular uh, structure. So imagine that you have a molecule going to, into an AMS. Can we predict what the mass spectral fingerprint would be? Um, so why, if we want Y as a function of X, Y is our mass spectra and X are our molecular features. There's many ways that you can extract molecular features. There are many different what we call fingerprints. So what we did in this study is we tested a broad range. And when we went through the training process, it looked like we could pick a whole range of features from various public libraries and they all work equally well. However, when we use that model in anger, um, and we actually predicted the mass spectra of a very complex aerosol from um, a biogenic precursor, this is the measured mass spectra, and these are the predicted mass spectra from those fingerprints that e all equally look great when you look to individual compounds, but one of them is terrible. It captures nothing useful in the mass spectra, but some are better than others. So again, this reinforces that point that you, you need the domain expertise to understand what you fit and what you're predicting before you can release some of these algorithms into the wild. And again, this is, this is a quote from a uh, kind of a luminary in uh, machine learning field from Stanford, that coming up with these features is difficult, time consuming and requires expert knowledge of the field. But what we're seeing in aerosol literature now is people are appreciating this more and more. Um, and one approach when you don't have that much data is to use algorithms that are interpretable, i.e. you can understand why the algorithm is, is make, making the prediction it is. So rather than having a black box, and neural networks are like black boxes, some of the older algorithms that I mentioned before, you can actually understand why they're extracting the features to make that prediction. And again, that, that, that helps a scientist reinforce, you know, understanding, is this model, you, is it getting it right for the right reasons or is it just being lucky? Um, and again, we found that as well. Um, I won't go into too many details, I'm worried of the time, but what this diagram is really showing is um, we had two different laboratory data sets on bioaerosol, both looking at the same species uh, so you'd think both would give the same answer when applied to the ambient, but they didn't. They gave very different answers when they apply, when we applied that to um, um, data from London. And what's interesting there is we were quite limited in the uh, resolution of the instrument. And th there seems to be a sweet spot on this. So um, in terms of how much information your instrument can extract, and the ability for you to, to manage the amount of data you can get to train and the usefulness of the algorithm in the field. And there are some really nice examples now from aerosol cloud interaction literatures where you have instruments that take complex images. You can actually account for, strategically account for instrument drift, variable performance, and give you a relatively accurate classification algorithm. 
but you can only do that when you have enough information coming from the instrument. So in my previous slide, we only had five bits of information here, but in these instruments, we have a complex image. So you can take all of that information and break it down to deliver something that's quite accurate. So from an instrument manufacturer's perspective, in terms of using these for next generation um, applications in the field, there will be a sweet spot on the amount of information that the instrument needs to deliver for machine learning algorithms to do something useful with it. And we're exploring that at the moment. So prior to this talk, I then thought it'd be a great idea to um, work out what the aerosol community are doing uh, rather than just from peer-reviewed peer literature and what people see as being the most useful applications and challenges. So this was a short survey, I think it's still live, so people can still um, take part. And there was various um, questions that I asked, okay? So I asked people to identify what theme they, their work fell under. And I would say, by the way, there was, there was, there was only uh, just over 100 uh, participants, but it was um, UK, US, Europe, and across Asia. So it was a, ni it was a nice broad uh, uptake, really. But as we found in the peer review literature, most people will identify themselves as working in the environment, but also straddling things such as healthcare, and materials. And when you break that down in terms of the type of area they're looking at, there's quite a broad mix here from instrument development through to model development and application, which was quite nice. Um, most people weren't using machine learning area in their research, but a lot of people were considering it uh, as well as did have, you know, an increased number plan to use it as they were moving forward as well. Um, I then asked what type of specific and broad machine learning applications uh, they currently plan to use. And most of it fell into spectral and multivariate analysis. So again, that's looking at data from instrumentation. Um, not many people would have, were looking at surrogate models, um, which is interesting. And in terms of the types of machine learning, actually most of the people in the survey, and I know it could, there could be a, uh, a higher number of people taking the survey, were actually focusing on supervised learning as opposed to unsupervised learning. And that's for sure connected with this um, desire to look at data in the lab and then apply that to the field. I always like to see which programming language people are using um, from a kind of particularly sad point of view. But from a machine learning perspective, Python um, and MATLAB definitely dominate um, in terms of delivering those accessible libraries. Um, now, this is probably the, mo the most interesting set of questions. What do you feel might be the biggest challenges in adopting machine learning area in your work? And training came out on top, and you see this quite a lot, actually. So when you talk to people, even at the university here, <coughs> knowing what algorithms to use, how you use them, what platforms, and this kind of goes against, in some ways, you know, the, um, the, very, the much improved accessibility of machine learning. There is definitely a training need some might say this is why you have a, it's a good reason there's a CDT that you guys are on, okay? Uh, but also time constraints. Being able to commit time to um, learning machine learning and applying that in the field uh, in your area of research is, is a challenge. In terms of the dangers, most people identified quality control and then retraction of process knowledge. And that actually reinforces what I said before there's this um, idea that <coughs> machine learning will actually take, um, it will take control away from the domain scientists. I don't think that's necessarily true actually. Um, and again, there are approaches you can use to understand um, why the machine learning is work, application is working the way it is. And that go, boils down again to what I said before on the choice of algorithm you're using. Reproducibility is an interesting one. Because we can import these libraries and use them and, and code sharing is now enforced across many journals. So that actually dictates what we do um, in terms of sharing software. It's an interesting that that's, that that's come up. And this is really an issue of scale. There's actually a mini crisis on re reproducibility going in the machine learning world at the moment. And it, the problems tend to focus at the really large scale. So, you know, when I mentioned before about the bleeding edge algorithms from the likes of Google's and IBM's and others, uh, there was a recent study that found 6% um, of 400 algorithms presented at two huge conferences 
Only 6% included the algorithm's code and only one in three shared the data. Um, so at the moment, there is a huge inward discussion going on at the moment across the machine learning circles because it, there is a mini crisis that will dictate where these, some of these applications go. But once you start looking at smaller amounts of data, there's a tremendous amount of documentation for some of these older techniques. And it, it doesn't matter that they're older methods, they might be the most appropriate <laughs> methods to use. Um, in terms of the biggest benefits, again, it was dominated by people think, thinking they could extract more information from experiments or even improving model measurement assimilation. Okay, reproducibility pops up again here. I thought it was quite interesting. And this actually reflects what I said before about the accessibility and ability to code, code share these days. Um, <clears throat> at the very start of the talk, I, I, I talked about this um, trough of delusionment. And I think that's a useful phase for us to be in at the moment, actually. It sounds quite dark, but it's not. And what that means is we're getting to the stage now where there's lots of opinion pieces that are really... Um, really helping to have us have helping us to have those community discussions about how do we take this forward appropriately and there was a really nice article i'd finished my talk by this stage i had to justify this at the eac i didn't write my talk around this uh, from an employee at google where he talked about the three pitfalls to avoid in machine learning and look here again it's domain expertise how do you split the data to train and test you know are there hidden variables we're missing uh, mistaking the objective. This is a really interesting one. So one easy test, for example, is if you can, once you've trained your machine learning algorithm to predict something, if you can then use it to predict the time the experiment had taken place, that's probably not a good thing. Okay, so you're learning inappropriate um, relationships in the data. And also, um, it might be machine learning is not the appropriate tool to use, just because there's so much hype. We shouldn't ignore the fact that there are alternative methods for understanding and uh, data dependencies across aerosol sciences. And I think pure machine learning applications have quite a limited lifespan now, actually. Uh, we had a great talk from um, uh, one of the main Julia developers at the universe in our Data Science Institute recently. Now, Julia is a new, la relatively new language. Version one was released uh, last December, I think. It's come out of MIT. It looks like Python, but it's as quick as C. So that's the holy grail for some of us because it's, it's relatively easy to interpret and code up. But one of, why it's being used across machine learning uh, domains is because in Julia, you can create a model that's automatically differentiated, uh, i.e. you can automatically build the, the derivative of your model. And what that means is, if you take, for example, what this graph is showing, you can combine neural networks with a process model, and then through the learning process to the outcome you want, you're actually embedding process knowledge within the machine learning pipeline. And this, this is where it's going to go. And again, this was reaffirmed in a fantastic article in Nature recently that said the next step will be hybrid modeling approaches. And when this talk was given, so this was given by Mike Inns uh, at Manchester, Mike actually noted the FDA have now banned pure machine learning representations in drug design because of the problems with reproducibility and in not being able to interpret what the algorithm is doing. So I think this is a positive direction, but this again will reshape what we do from a community point of view. What do, where, how we're developing software and where we're sharing that. If we want to really benefit from machine learning in an aerosol perspective, we should rethink about what we're doing in terms of the platforms that we're using. So I'll end with, sort of, with, a, with, a, with a set of questions and a set of points really. Uh, and it's somewhat provocative where in, in saying, do we really value the slow and hard stuff? It is difficult to develop process models because they're, you know, they're, they're slow to develop, they're slow to apply. But they're very important, as we see in the last slide. We've now got renewed opportunities to use what we have already and combine that with the potential that machine learning has. Databases, calibration standards, and metadata, it's not sexy science, but it's so important. We need to revalue what we're doing in terms of building up our process knowledge of what's going on in aerosol particles and in, in, in areas that aerosol particles are used. So th we need this renewed vigor in combining mechanistic and empirical models. Training is key, but it's a hugely heterogeneous issue. I'm quite lucky in the sense that I have a very accessible data science institute here. 
some people don't. Some institutions have, uh, let's say, for example, environmental science group sat within the same building as a maths group, and they naturally benefit from that. Okay. We need to think about what platforms we'll be using in five plus years. Development is, is growing at such a pace. What we learn in the next two years might not necessarily be the best approach in five. So we need to be a little bit ahead of the curve. And we, we can set up the appropriate discussions to have that. <coughs> is there a role for big tech companies? <coughs> you know, if the likes of Google's and IBM's of this world are really pushing this from a development perspective, are we having the right conversations uh, to exploit what's coming out, knowing the problems with reproducibility, of course, to exploit some of the developments there in aerosol science? Sharing code is a fantastic step. Knowing how to use it is equally important. There's lots of open source models available. Knowing how to run it is a, is, is a different beast altogether. And I think we might benefit from building up a community repository of examples and data, and that feeds back to the training element. So there are challenges, but it's a very exciting time to be involved with machine learning. And I think we need to have the community um, getting together to discuss about how we take this forward. And I'll end my talk there. And I think I'm a bit over, but if you have any questions, uh, yeah, feel free. Thank you, Dave. Anyone who'd like to ask a question? Is there a risk of when you're kind of doing the more hybrid modeling of ending up reinforcing kind of bias because we've missed an area in studies and we're using kind of the like supervised learning will then end up with more bias rather than less bias? Yeah, so we have that problem already actually, even before we bolted in hybrid models, I would say. Um, so you want, for, for example, there's a huge um, research area at the moment trying to understand what the key sensitivities are in global models, and then that use that to dictate next generation of research projects. But of course, we know these global models aren't perfect. So there's a bias there in already. And I guess you're right. I think what the problem here is, those, some of those global models have taken, even with the problems they have, five to 10 years to develop. What we've got here is we've got a potential to develop next generation of models in a year or two years time. And that means that if they become hardwired in the community, we need to make sure that that developmental phase includes the right people making the right checks and balances and the right documentation. Yes, there is a danger. I think we're in a better place now to try and make sure that doesn't happen. And that's largely because of this trough of delusionment. You know, we've got the enough community discussions taking place now and people are wary enough to balance the potential with the dangers. Um, yeah, so that's my long answer. Yes, we are in a danger, but hopefully we can have the right conversations to stop that happening. Dave, I have a question just to pick up on this rather interesting example of failure, which you, you noted. So I'm quite taking you know, this, this example of actually, if you can predict the day your measurement was taken, that's probably a bad sign. You know, I guess if you can predict which instrument was used to take the data, that's a bad sign because that's uh, so, so in terms of actually the quality of the data that these models are dependent on is hugely variable. You know, if you're if you're building up, if you need to use machine learning, as you um, highlighted in that one publication, to look at how air quality can be improved, that's hugely dependent on the quality of the data that goes in. And and different people that the instruments they're using might be calibrated to different standards. They yeah. may be making measurements on different time scales. Um, and, and so on. So I guess my question is, is it, uh, at what level is it actually feasible to get the data in a form of high enough quality initially that you can actually benefit from this type of approach? How, yeah. how do we know that the data of sufficient quality? Yeah, absolutely. So I would take two approaches to answering this question. <clears throat> and this is what I said, I, I touched on what I said in terms of this sweet spot, right, between the algorithms, but also what, in, what information the instrument can deliver. So in some examples, what we're, what we're seeing now is um, some instruments with enough information can be broken down into latent features that then have a probability that can actually buffer, if you like, instrument drift, you know, or varying calibration standards. 
if the algorithm is too rigid, so you're basically saying, I have the data from this instrument, I'm fitting my supervised machine learning algorithm, and it doesn't account for this drift, you are going to get different answers when you apply it to a different instrument. And that's what actually we found in that bioaerosol study. You can actually train your algorithm to two different instruments looking at the same species and get two different answers in the field, which is what you don't want. If those instruments have enough information in them, you can actually build in this probability framework where you can actually break that information down to a smaller number of features that are allowed to vary in that space, but then don't significantly affect your prediction accuracy. So there is a sweet spot there that we need to explore a little bit more. On the other side of things, from an air quality point of view, we still don't know if having a lot of bad information is useful. So if you look at these low cost sensors, for example, if you add 100 of these in a city center, if you combine all of that information to look at trends, that might still be okay. If you have two and they're both completely disagree, statistically, that's a bad position to be in. I think so there's two different challenges there. You have the low cost, low information aerosol instrumentation, and you have the high end, large amounts of information. And I don't think we know yet but we're making good progress to, to deal with both. And then of course, we can bring them together. And looking at, for example, networks of aerosol instrumentation from air quality, where you have a single very accurate instrument and then a whole network of low quality stuff is something that's ongoing at the moment. Okay. Yeah, well. And maybe in the answer is, but how do you stop people from adapting the algorithms to do what they're specifically researching from so that because obviously when you're um, in different universities, people use different kind of methods of obtaining um, information. So how do you make sure that the algorithm is robust enough that it can deal with the interpretation from different people? Um, so in terms of, so for example, if you had um, two different research groups using the same algorithm, but they're taking different approaches to generating data in their labs, for example. Yeah. Yeah, so again, choice of algorithm. So some of the algorithms you can interpret and understand. Uh, let's say, for as an example, um, we wanted to um, predict um, the source of an aerosol mass spectral fingerprint. And you had two groups who were looking, who had two different chambers. So they were doing things very differently, but they were using the same algorithm and they got different results. Some of these algorithms, you can understand why those results are different. You could basically get the algorithm to show you what features and the connections between those features it's learning. That would then, that's the information then you can use to go back to the experiments and go, ah, actually, we're biasing what the algorithm's learning. Some algorithms can't be interpreted that way. So this goes back to that black box approach. Um, Key to all of this is making sure, again, that there is enough provenance in that data. So even if, you know, worst case scenario, algorithms are developed, they're published, they're used. If someone wants to go back and check that, we need to know exactly what, how the information was collected, what instruments were used, who did it, what were the aerosols generated using, you know, the, the boring but important metadata needs to be in there as well, if that answers your question. Should should they be similar though? So say if these two different, would you want them to be more similar, like creating like a standardized way that everyone can compare their data against each other? So no matter what instrument you use, you can have you can say yeah, I can compare it to them because obviously you know you've used the same algorithm but kind of interpret it in a way. How do you make sure that you can do that? Would yeah, you? it's a good question. You don't necessarily want that to be absolutely. You don't necessarily want that to be true. Um, I think the point being you can make, depending on how much data you have and what you're looking at, you can actually select some of your algorithms to give you that confidence to be interpret why there are any differences being observed. Okay. Yeah. My last question, I mean, I think it's just a follow up to the first question. Don't you think that it could lead to probably data manipulations? Sorry, can you say that again? Data manipulation. I mean, if somebody has a, an experimental data, you can, I, I mean, I can just, this is my algorithm. I can train it to predict whatever I want to see. So obviously you can manipulate data to get whatever result that you want. Yeah, 
I, yeah, absolutely. How do you stop people doing that? I mean, that boils down to ethics, right? Uh, and I think an element of training. I for, for so for a while, controversially, um, we don't let people in our labs without health and safety checks. I would suggest there needs to be an equivalent for software as well. So almost like a driving license that people don't like me saying, um, but that covers best practices. So you're absolutely right, but this is a much more broader issue. And um, from a machine, machine learning perspective, what we're seeing at the moment is we're, we're being bombarded constantly by the local council and transport authorities who are being potentially sold new technologies for monitoring traffic lights in response to PM concentrations, yeah. okay? Most of those companies <laughs> have completely closed source algorithms. So no one knows why the changes are being implemented. So there has to be an ethical question here about, you know, how do you, which, how do you implement trust um, in the use of machine learning for whatever, whatever particular applications you have? And it straddles everything from training to ethics to, you know, the money that's involved, the timescales you have. You can't guarantee that people won't fiddle data. Um, I don't, I don't really know what the ideal um, answer is here, um, but from a research community perspective, you can at least try and ensure that everything is completely open such that people can make sure checks and balances can be applied to that data. But how do you yourself, like un the unconscious part, what if you want your data to look good and unconsciously you're, you are doing it? How do you, how do you know the line what not to cross because obviously it's your data and do you know what I mean? Like, how do you stop? Can you stop that? Can you regulate that? Um, can you regulate unconscious bias? Ooh, there's a question. I didn't, I didn't get this one at the EAC. <laughs> um, I don't know. I think um, this, again, part of this boils down to um, in the age of open data, and this is a double-edged sword, right, for open data and open source software, you have a lot of people who want to make, for example, a lot of money out of particular problems in the environment and other things. Um, it's up to the domain-based scientists and regulators to actually start thinking about how we manage this. Um, how do you, I and mean, I'm seeing this from a quite a different perspective in the sense that I know a lot of the stuff that's going on in smart cities projects where there's so much money to be made out of new software services. Um, there's a lot going on at the moment to try and tackle this, but it's not just a case of what you do in the lab. It's everything from, you know, licensing through to policy change and other things. I don't think there's an easy answer to your question. Um, so I'm, I, <laughs> sorry, I can't quite answer it in a straightforward way. Um, yeah. One last question. Uh, I guess this kind of flows into what you had on slide 25, which was, you made a, a distinction, I think, between training and training, training, training. Uh, is this because you can see different forms of training, like in ethics or in the way that you interpret machine learning? What did you mean by that? Uh, I should have pointed out. So these these are the questions. Ah, at least it's not come through. These are the questions that I put in the form, and these were. Um, additions that these the uh, people who took the survey could add. Uh, but someone was so obsessed with training, they wrote <laughs> it three times. But no, but, no, but I think you're right. I think um, you can't learn everything you need to... I should probably shouldn't be saying... You can't learn everything you need to know in terms of software best practices in two days. There has to be elements of best practices through to, you know, code sharing and other things. Um, and it takes time. It takes time to adopt those best practices. As I said before, in it, in it sometimes boils down to the institution you're in. Um, Manchester University has a, a quite, it's, it's got a, a growing uh, set of incentives to make sure that we adopt those best practices through for everything through to promotion criteria. I mean, some institutions are seeing this as a very important, um, um, really key point of how we take things forward. But yeah, there are different elements to that training. Learning how to import an algorithm, fit it and apply it is one thing. How to share it with your community and make sure it works on a platform in 10 years is a very different thing altogether. Great. 
Okay, well, thanks. Thanks very much, Dave.